Hi, Megan. Thanks for joining me here today. Hi, thanks for having me. So it is the evening, as I understand it. Uh, the little ones are with your husband getting ready uh, to go to bed, uh, and you've put some time aside in the day to do this interview. I'm curious about how being a creative person works in terms of juggling uh, all of those aspects of your life. How does that work in your situation? Oh my goodness. That's a great question. Uh, it's, it's just not easy. Um, it's not, it's really challenging. It's really, really challenging, but I have a really strange story to tell you about that. Do you want to hear it? Oh, I'd love to. Yes. So, uh, I used to be signed with a major label and when I was initially signed, they wanted me to do a lot of co-writing with some very famous and very prestigious uh, songwriters. So I went on all these co-writing um, trips, like a lot of them were in LA, some were in New York. Um, and I would go into these studios and there was one studio in particular. It was so beautiful. Like I cannot, I've never been in such a nice space. So like you walk in the main studio room, there was, it was just like this huge library out of Harry Potter, like all the sound yeah. absorption was taken up by these like color coded books that were like all these really dark, rich jewel tones. And they were like lamps and there were chaises and microphones hanging from the ceilings and there were drum kits everywhere and just like every imaginable instrument. It was so gorgeous. And then there was another room. The whole room was just like this glowing pool that had like water under the under the water the lights were lit and they they changed color and there were mics in that room wow it was the most distracting like i couldn't write anything in that space it was so amazing just to be there i couldn't i couldn't stand it like it was too beautiful wow <laughs> so, in a weird way for me my creativity really flows when I'm in discomfort. Like really? a lot of times, yeah, it's really strange, but it really works for somebody in my situation with two little kids at home all the time. You know, they've never been to daycare. And my oldest, he went to school for about four months before COVID kicked in. So oh. um, having to work from home in a small-ish house with two kids at all times you know, I, I have specific times during the day in which to be creative. So I get up at five usually, and then I work from five to 12 and my husband has the kids and then we switch and I take the kids from 12 till six and then we hopefully try and put them to bed. And then sometimes I work in the night too. So like I, inspiration must strike between the hours of five and 12. <laughs> and um, so for me, like, that one particular writing experience, but really a lot of those co-writing experiences where these people just had the most beautiful homes. Like they were like palatial studios in the Hollywood Hills and it was too distracting for me. So wow. being able to come away from that, having been com completely unproductive because it was just too distracting <laughs> to be like, okay with the situation that I'm in now where I'm a lot of times I'm, you know, I'm writing songs in chaos there's children screaming and and wanting me and climbing around on the floor and i'm just continuing to write lyrics and you know so i don't know i don't know what that is it's probably like i could do some therapy on that but <laughs> <laughs> it all i mean it feels like hey if i go in i'm this beautiful picturesque mountain with cabin in the woods with beautiful streams running by no that's too beautiful it's going to distract me from getting writing done is that the same sort of thing yes like I, you know what I think it is? Marv, I think I need to get out. I, I need to want to get into my own head. Like I need okay. to want to leave the situation to go into myself and like retreat within myself and just kind of like, you know, be in my creativity, which is really in my own self. So okay. if there's too much awesome stuff going on out here, I just want to be out here and like experience it. But then, you know, if it, if it kind of sucks around here, it doesn't suck like I love my kids but you know if I if I know I have like a certain amount of time and then I'm going to be like dealing with um you know kids and stuff then I I'm able to I feel I feel horrible it really doesn't suck but it is a challenge and it makes me want to like go into myself before I then go out of myself and be with my kids 
Okay, and 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 it does sound uh, since you and Jason have divided up the, uh, the the parental roles in such a way that you can both get your creative work done and business work done, yeah. that you don't wait for the muse to find you. You basically say, "Hey, I'm here. You, you're you're. I'm putting you to work now." Like you you pretty much force it into that time slot. I don't. I don't want to say I force it because it won't be forced. Uh -huh. <laughs> but it's more like I meet it there. I say, okay, I'm, I'll be here. And if you want to be here too, great. <laughs> we're not here. We're going to miss each other. So right. you should show up when I show up so we can work together. On <laughs> this would be nice. I'll leave out a plate of warm uh, yeah. <laughs> cookies and milk. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise I'm, you know, I, it gets to 12 o'clock and I'm like, okay, well, I guess, I guess that's it for today. And now I have to wait to meet the muse or whatever to be, I have to wait another, I don't know how many hours, like, right. you know, hours and hours until I can work on it again. And that's, that can be, it can be like, sometimes it feels like I'm, you know, when you first fall in love with someone and you just can't wait till you see them the next time. It, it's that kind of like desperate feeling where I'm like, I just need to get back and work on this piece or, you know, um, but I have to wait. So it's better if it shows up when it, when I'm available. Yeah. Okay. No, uh, because you brought it up. Um, was it love at first sight with you and music or how, how did you get into that? Was it just this magical moment where you discovered the beauty of music and said, I have to do this or, or was it some other, uh, some other romantic comedy? <laughs> oh, I don't remember. I don't remember. I just, music just feels like breathing. It, it's just something that's, I've just always, I've just always done. It's always been a part of my life and my, um, in my younger years growing up, my family was really, really musical. There's always music playing and people playing instruments. And uh, I I had some, like, I had a really hard time learning to play. Um, and later I would come to find out that I have dyslexia, so I can't actually read notes on a page. It's not possible for my brain to differentiate between the dots and the lines. They're just too close together. But um, so that was always really weird, but I just played by ear, like, and it just is, it just feels really natural to me. So I don't ever remember, like, there's never really a moment for me where I was like, I'm into music now, but I, there was a distinct moment where I was like, I'm going to try to be a musician. That was, a, that was a moment. But as far as my relationship with music, it's just, it's like, it's always been in me or part of me. So when did you know for sure that musician is that career that you wanted to? Yeah, that was a that was a distinct moment. So I studied animation. I actually went to school for animation because I, you know, I really love visual arts as well. Um, but had really really horrible like um, anxiety. Is I used to call it stage fright, but really it's just anxiety. So I could never perform. So I, I, I loved to sing like by myself and I thought I sounded great by myself, but as soon as I get in front of people, it would just, it was downhill. So um, I ended up just assuming I would never be a musician um, and going to school and studying animation, which was like a practical use of my love of drawing as well. So uh, but while I was there, I learned about recording and vocal recording and because that's part of the animation process is you it, here, or at least like the North American way of animating is that you start with um, the sounds like the voices and then you animate to the voices. So um, I started to want to record some of the songs I was like secretly writing. And so that just sort of developed over time where I, I kept writing and, and recording songs like for myself and sharing them with like my sisters or like, you know, a very few select people. Um, and then I moved out to Halifax, Nova Scotia for a job in animation. And I was enjoying my job. It was great. Like it was fun, but it was so creatively unrewarding. And it's weird because you would think it's a creative field because you're drawing, but really my creativity is like, my definition of creativity is to bring something into existence. Like to create something is to bring it into existence. So if you're bringing something into existence, that means 
it's somewhere else and then it comes through you into this realm which kind of is like a little wooey but that's just how I like to think about it and I wasn't doing any of that I was just getting a script from a director and then he was like draw it this way draw these characters doing these things and there was very little creativity on my part and so I I there was an exact moment um I was sitting at my drafting table at work and I just was like, you know what, this is cool. And I was surrounded by friends and people who were 10 years older than me still doing it. And I was like, I could, I could see myself doing this for another 10 years or, um, or I could take a giant leap of faith and see what would happen if I were to say, make an album. Wow. Well, you went from secretly singing, sharing maybe with your sisters to make an album. That, yeah. That's quite a, that is quite a leap. Yeah. Uh, and my, my thought process, I mean, like you do, I know you work with writers and authors. My thought process behind that was, it, it's probably the same maybe for some of your authors is like, I just wanted to make something that I would be happy with and, and like, I just wanted to like make that dream a reality, whether or not anyone else cared about it. It wasn't up to me, but if I could just make an album that I was proud of and put it out there and let it go, um, I could die happy. I, I wouldn't have this thing in me that I, like I, it felt like it this unfulfilled promise or something like, um, yeah, it was like really ignoring this huge dream that I had to make an album, which I assume a lot of people have a huge dream to write a book, right? Or tell a story. It's kind of the same thing. So um, I told myself, like, all you have to do is make the album. Whatever else happens with it, it's not up to you. It doesn't have anything to do with you, really. You just have to make this album that you could die feeling proud of. And that's, that's it. That's as far as we need to go. Yeah. So were you already working with other musicians or was the album a concept that you had, you wanted to write everything and then it was, okay, now I need to find, now you were going to be the vocalist, obviously. What, what instruments were you playing? What did you need to bring into this? I wrote all the instruments, or sorry, I wrote all the songs on my guitar and um, yeah, that, I just wrote a bunch of songs and hired a producer. His name is Les Cooper. He's an extremely talented producer. Um, who also did these like amazing string and horn arrangements for my album. Um, and so I, I saved up, it took me four years to save, to make the album, wow. I saved up all my money and hired him. And then he knew a bunch of players who were amazing. And I've, I stayed in Toronto, um, sleeping on various couches and like, you know, really just getting, it was like a, it was a real, um, like it was a real labor of love. Like I, you know, I was okay. scraping by to try and do that. And Jason was supporting me by, you know, covering our apartment and, and our bills in Halifax. But yeah, I paid for the album in, in cash and say I saved up and did that. Wow. Not on credit. Um, now, what, what was that first album? It was called the Crickets Orchestra. That, that was your, that was your first album. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So Beautiful I, album too. I put wow. anything on it that I wanted. I, I, yeah. It was a splurge. It was just like, don't hold back. This is your chance. This is the album, you know, this is the Die Happy album. So go for it. So I, you know, Les and I were like, what do you want on this? And I was like, I don't know. What's the twinkly stars? And he's like, let's call that a vibraphone. I'm like, okay. So that's kind of how it went. Cause you know, I don't read music, but I, I'm really visual. So for me, a lot of the songs were like imagery using sound that would be equivalent to imagery. Like if I was to right. paint the scene, we tried to use sounds that would symbolize like various colors or textures. Yeah. So many questions. I, I so many ways I can go with the question. I, I'm when you talk about visual imagery, I'm thinking about some of the music videos you've put together and and the visual presentation. I know, I mean, I think it snowed, it looks like it was shot in downtown Toronto at City Hall, the skating rink, is that where it was? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so like a lot of the, well, all of the videos for that album, a label had been, a label came on at that point. So that was the, yeah, the label came afterwards, right? 
Yeah. But, you know, some of the ideas in the videos were mine. It was just really exciting to make videos at that point and have a label and be in Toronto and stay at a nice hotel as opposed to <laughs> as a on coach. Everyone <laughs> have me on their couch. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the other thing I'm curious to ask is when, when, a, when you're working on a song, what comes first? Is it the melody? Is it the, the guitar? Is it the vocals? How, how does that all come together for you? Yeah, I know this, uh, this is an interesting question. I know it works different for everybody. And, and a lot of artists can write all different ways. Like sometimes the lyrics come first, sometimes the like, melody comes first. For me, everything has to come all at the same time. So lyrics and uh, melody and chords, I just sit down and start playing. And um, I, I think it's because like, I, I can't fit words into a melody. I, I can't, because the melody dictates what the words are going to be and the words dictate what the melody is going to be. So um, when I write a song, I sit down and start playing and um, sometimes parts of it sound good. And then I just build on that. And yeah, that's how it works for me. So you're just kind of jamming with the muse and recording it and then saying, well, I like this part. I'm going to keep that. I'm going to modify yeah. that. Okay. So how I do it is I turn on a video program and cause I can't, I don't write, I can't write down the chords. It just right. takes too long and I can't read them anyway. So um, I can see what I'm playing. So I, you know, if I forget or whatever um, and I just, I'll just start singing random stuff that just comes out and playing along with what I'm singing and I'll do that for like eight minutes, 10 minutes, and then I'll go back and listen to it and be like, okay, that works. And it should probably then go here. I put these two pieces together and then I have like, I'll have the beginning of a verse or the beginning of a chorus. And you know, with a song, the way that I write them, it's more traditional where there's, it's like an A, B, maybe C pattern. So there's a verse, a chorus, verse, chorus, sometimes a bridge, and then a chorus. And so all I really need is a verse and chorus. I just need the format for those two things. And then I can plug in lyrics. And uh, so, you know, it's not, I, I've, I've kind of gotten to a point where it's, it's not, it can come rather, it's starting to come easier for me, but I mean, I've been doing this for like 25 years. <laughs> so. <Wow>. <laughs> so I want to go, uh, so Cricket's Orchestra was an independently produced and yeah. then a label came along was was that when you were working on the second album or did the label come after somebody heard crickets orchestra yeah. yeah it's a pretty cool story um yeah i made the crickets orchestra it was fully finished and i was trying to get a manager here in halifax and nobody would manage me um they, you know everybody's just busy and uh and then i went to the halifax film festival where i met a lot of film and tv people um publishing people and they listened to the album and loved it and they arranged a um they like put together this amazing um show for me at the viper room in los angeles so i went from playing open mics like a few open mics here in halifax to playing the viper room in los angeles for five major labels like there were five wow. major label people who came out and i'll tell you at the like as soon as people knew that that was happening, everybody could make it. I'll manage you now. Yeah. Right? Okay. It was like, oh, okay, great. I'm so glad you believe in my music. So I, you know, I had a lot, I, I had like three or four major label deals and no one to help me understand like what the deals were saying or, so, I mean, I had to get a manager, I had to get a, a lawyer, a, a booking agent, like, all, all of that had to happen really quickly um, in order for me to sign a deal, which I ended up signing with Sire Records, who's under the Warner Brothers umbrella. And uh, yeah, that, that was so exciting. It was just so exciting. So they bought the masters of my album. I kept the publishing. I've, I've kept all the publishing of my music. So okay. um, they own the masters. So they have the masters, but you still have the rights to the actual song itself. So you can re-record? I can, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm curious how that works. Because, yeah, rights are really critical to creatives sure. because, yep. you know, new rights come along, new digital rights and all kinds of other uh, forms. So that's cool. So you've, you've managed to, to maintain 
some of that control, even though you've worked with major labels? Yes. I made sure that that was in the contract that I, I retained the royalties. Yeah. So you talked about the, you know, playing open mic in Halifax, beautiful, you know, gorgeous uh, city, you know, yeah. world, world-class world city, actually. Here, but, yeah. <laughs> but open mics in Halifax and then going to the Viper Room in LA and other places like that, that must have been a startling thing. At what point, so I, I know you've won a Juno Award, at what point did that happen? And, and that must have been a, a different sort of experience as well, I can imagine. Yeah, winning the Juno was, was so, so shocking. Like, um, so, um, you know, I signed with my label. We started, Jason and I started touring. So he quit his job and I, I hired him as my guitarist and became my husband and um, <laughs> just started touring. And then we got a Juno nomination and I was like, oh, that's, that's fun. Uh, you know, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to win or anything. So, um, and then the day the Junos were happening, I, I eventually decided to go. Um, everybody's like, no. And where were they that year? You, know, you have to be there. They were in Toronto. Okay. So um, Jason and I went and just before the Junos, I was like, you know what, I'm not going to win. And it's going to be really awkward. And do we have to go? And Jason was like, yes, we need to go see all these amazing bands that are playing at the show. So I was like, all right, let's just go watch the show. Like, let's just go have fun and be at the show. And I was, I remember the moment they called me, I had my shoes off because they were really uncomfortable. Like my category came up and I was sitting next to um, Jason and Rich Turfry, who's buck 65. And he's like, Megan, you should put your shoes on. It's good. You could get called. I'm not going to get called. And then they call my name and I was like, oh, shoot, I got to get my shoes on. And then I like had to walk through this huge stadium. That was another thing. I was like way in the back. So I was like, they're not going to call me. I'm, I'm in the back of the stadium. But yeah, so it was really surreal. Like I kind of felt like I was floating outside of my body. I think the whole time, I don't remember what I said. Um, and it was really exciting, really exciting and special and yeah, it was really fun. Awesome, awesome. Does it have a prestigious place, like in your studio, above the mantle? Like, where do you keep it? No, it doesn't. And um, it doesn't. I, 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 ha I have, like, a certain feeling about awards. I mean, I know that I won this Juno Award, and I've won other awards, but they, it doesn't mean that I was the best anything. Like, um, it just it it's it's based on voting and sometimes you know it can be based on popularity and a lot of times it's based on merit and credit i would rather not really focus on those things i'd rather focus on what i'm what i'm working on now like what what am right. i doing next? what am i creating next i actually got that tip from um a visual artist um i'm gonna have to email you his name you can put in the show notes but uh, I did a, I did a, a gallery show one time um, while I was playing, while I was on tour, I, I did a show at a gallery for some of my paintings and I was so stressed out. I was like more stressed out about that than my wedding. Like it was so stressful <laughs> to have my paintings in a gallery and I, an artist, this artist came, he's a really wonderful experienced artist. And I was like, how do you do this? Like, how do you get through this? And he's like, I just think about what I'm doing next. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to do that. So that was a really useful way for me to manage my anxiety. Um, you know, when it comes to music and albums, I mean, you're only pink has said it. You're only as big as what you did last and you just got to keep going. Yeah. Cool. Um, let's talk a little bit about your painting. So sometimes when you're in, in your studio and you're waiting, uh, you, you've got a date with your muse does the muse visit you with a visual inspiration sometimes instead of music? Is that where, where you get some sort of, you get something and then you know that this is going to be a song and this is going to be a, a painting? Yeah. It's like, I have two, it's like I have two muses, which can be kind of frustrating at times because, um, I mean, I have deadlines for things, but I don't know if they're, this is a really interesting question. I don't know if they're the same thing or if they're two separate things, but um, 
I need to take breaks sometimes. Okay, as an author, do you find this like you need to just take a break from what you're writing? Yeah, I usually switch from fiction to nonfiction or so. Or you're still like writing. That. Yeah. You're still writing, you're just switching from fiction. Okay, it's like that exact same thing with me, but with art and music. So um, if I'm really, really stuck on a song, I need to do, I need to paint. And if I'm super frustrated with a painting, I need to write some music. And so I just go between the two and I'm constantly, constantly trying to keep up with and produce in both of those arenas. Yeah. Cool. Cool. So you and Jason had traveled a lot. I actually saw you guys perform live in Hamilton. I can't even, eight years ago, maybe. I'm not even sure how long ago it was, but what's that? Is it a Christmas show? I think it was, a, I think it was a Christmas show. I remember it was cold. <laughs> so it was, it was uh, jackets and everything. Um, and, and, and it was just the two of you with, with, you know, with a company with like the, a music box that, that did some of the, some of the other backgrounds uh, for you guys. But, um, and, and you've traveled extensively. Now I was going to ask how COVID changed that, but I know that you had children and that probably changed it well before the pandemic. Is that true? Like, did you, you change the touring schedule for family? Yes. And actually like, I'm, I'm really grateful now at this point, but, um, so what ended up happening was it was, you know, it was hell. It was hell basically to go through what we went through, but then to be here now in this position, I'm so grateful that everything happened the way it did. But, um, after we won the Juno, you know, of course our label was like, well, now we're, we got to get another album out really fast. We put out a Christmas album like months later and then they're like, okay, let's start working on the next one. So, at that point in my life, I, I was dealing with major anxiety. Um, you know, the pressure I felt not put on me by my label. Like the, the label was really amazing. My management was great. It was all just me being like, I have to like exceed everyone's expectations and be unbelievable and astounding. And of course, you know, I can't, I couldn't write. <laughs> I was feeling and thinking that way. Um, so it took a long time to get the the second album ready to go. And finally we did. And, you know, I wanted to try and take it in a different direction, which we did. And we started doing promotional touring for it. And on the promo tour, I started to feel really, really sick. And I thought, you know, okay, I've got the flu. I've dealt with the flu on tour. I've dealt with like everything on tour. I just sing through it something happens to me when I get on stage that, you know, whatever it is, the migraine or the anxiety, whatever, it goes away for those, you know, that hour that I'm on stage or those minutes that I'm on stage and comes, it comes right back as soon as I'm walking off stage. Um, and I was like, I'll just sing through it, but I couldn't do it this time. So I knew something was up and I actually, we were in Toronto on our way back to Halifax. We were on our second last stop on the tour and I had to be hospitalized um, because I couldn't like keep anything down for like eight hours. I just threw up constantly. And Jason was like, okay, we have to, we, I'm taking you to the hospital. So we went to the hospital and found out that I was pregnant. Um, and you know, we had been married for 10 years and I just assumed we were just gonna, music was going to be our main focus. And, um, I was really happy with that. And then, you know, to find this out, when we're doing a promo tour for my second major label album release was just like really, really scary and shocking and exciting. And so we planned, you know, I had, I had a bunch of really big tours lined up to promote the album. We planned to um, go home for a couple of weeks, hopefully like, you know, my morning sickness would go away and then we could get back on the road and then we would tour and then I, you know, my label was like, we've had other musicians who have had kids, so you can take like six weeks off and then we need you back on the road. And I'm like, yep, got it. Okay, I'll do that. Um, but it didn't work out that way. Um, I ended up having hyperemesis, which is, I don't know if you've seen the new Amy Schumer documentary called um, Expecting Amy, but it's constant nausea and vomiting during pregnancy. So oh. 
it's no joke. It's, it's really not a joke. If you watch that documentary, I watched it and I was like, this is my exact experience. Like, wow. Uh, just not, you know, just driving and throwing up and sitting and throwing up and just throwing up everywhere all the time. It's for the for the whole for the whole nine and a half months. Oh, not yeah. just like one trimester or or oh no, oh wow. No, so you know, my label was like, okay, Megan, I, you know, I was like, I literally can't really go anywhere without barfing. So, you know, getting on an airplane and flying to a show and getting on stage it, it was just like i i mean i can do it but it's going to be really gross and hard and throwing up constantly is really exhausting like i pulled muscles like my you know my my ab muscles were all like just painful all the time i started getting cavities just from like you know it's no joke like it's really really serious and there's of course there's no cure nobody knows what to do for you they're like just try not to be stressed out and you're like okay my career is disappearing and I, you know I'm sick all the time but I'll try not to be stressed out well I mean it was just really really difficult and my label did wait for me but they said you know after you have your baby you've got to you've got to do these tours we have these major major tours lined up for you and you have to do them so I, of course, you know, I was absolutely going to do that. And everyone was like, Megan, your pregnancy was so bad. Like your delivery can't be any worse than this. So don't worry, you're going to have the baby and then you'll be fine. Um, but <laughs> once again, it's not how it went. Um, I had a really bad delivery. Um, it was, it was, I'm going to not talk about any details, but just let you know that I had to get over a hundred stitches and I had an eight month recovery from that. Oh. Yeah. So it was two years of hell from um, my first initially finding out I was pregnant on, you know, during the promo tour. And then till when I, I finally had the all clear from my doctor that I had healed from the, from the delivery. So by that point, I had told my label, I am not going to tour. I can't, I can't be away from my doctor for over a week. And I also can't, I couldn't walk for three months. So I couldn't get on a plane. I couldn't tour. I couldn't walk on a stage. I had like a, an actual cane. Like I had to use a cane. So I was like, I can't, you know, I can't walk on stage with a cane and I can't stand playing my guitar with a cane. Like it just, I couldn't, I could, just couldn't even imagine it the whole time taking care of a baby. Like, so everything went away. Everything went away. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Crazy. And that's, and you said like his music is, is, is breathing to you uh, <laughs> as well. Right. So, yeah. so, and then I'm curious because what you've done is you've taken your talent, your skill, your passion, and you've helped other people mm -hmm. channel their own story into music in a way that you're giving them wings in, in ways to describe moments in their lives, whether it's a wedding, child, love, loss, whatever it is. Mm. Um, where did our song come from? First, for, for those not familiar, explain what our song is and, and, and how that sort of evolved. Well, okay, so I, I had my, my baby and I was completely, you know, devastated and exhilarated. I loved him. I could not believe the insane love that I had for this baby. Like it was, it was supernatural. It was unbelievable to me. Um, and <laughs> I said, Jason, we have to have another one. And he was like, you're insane. You're <laughs> totally insane. And I was like, I know I am, but it's just this love I feel. It, it, it's so crazy. Um, so we had, after, you know, I had healed somewhat, wow. we had our second son and it was just as bad. Only I had a C-section this time. So it wasn't two years, of recover. it wasn't two years of recovery. It was one, it was 10, like nine and a half solid months of throwing up again. But yeah. then it was like a six week recovery. Like it was like going to the spa, getting a C-section was just like the best. I, <laughs> I couldn't believe how amazing it was. But after my second son was born, uh, I knew I could never have children again. Like it, my body was like, 
please don't ever do that to me again. So I was like, okay, I know I'm done. I'm done feeling this, you know, need to have children. Um, and I was once again, like this craziest love I felt for this baby and, and for my other son too, these children, I could not believe and still can't believe what, how much love just exploded out of me when, you know, I, I, I first met them. Um, but at the same time, it started to hit me like what had actually happened and, and the loss that I had experienced in my career um, because everyone left, you know, understandably so. And I, I'm not angry at my label or my management, but you know, if you don't have an artist, a touring artist, not touring is not making you money and you've, they've got to support their families too. I completely understand, but it just started to really sink in after my first son was born or sorry, after my second son was born. And I also had postpartum anxiety um, with him and I could feel myself sort of slipping down and down and down and down. And I had another kind of really clarifying moment where I thought to myself, I can keep sliding or I can try to pull myself out of this. And it was, it's kind of similar to like, in a way it was kind of similar to being in those studios that were really, really gorgeous and needing to be in a place that, you know, needing to be in a different place. I, I did not want to be in my life. I did not want to write about my life at that point. It, there was like too much. I couldn't process what had happened. I needed other stories. I needed other people's lives and other people's stories to go into. And I just thought, you know, like, how healing music is for me it's so healing for me and right now i i didn't want to use it to heal myself um but i still wanted to use it for good so i just i put a post out on social media and was like hey i would like to write a song for you about you anybody interested and like just you know the floodgates opened and people were lined up and yeah and that's how our song started so i i i started writing other people's experiences as if they were mine. So I would like go into their life and become them in a, in a way, like really empathize with them and their, their loss or their love or whatever it was they were experiencing. And I would write their song for them. And a lot of times, you know, their song was about a spouse or a child or um, a parent or, or somebody really close to them. And so I wanted, I wanted to call it our song because it's like their song, but it's also my song because I wrote it and everybody, you know, can find themselves somewhere in one of these, our songs, like, you know, everybody shares all of these same experiences. So that's why I, I called it our song. Oh, that is, that is beautiful. I love that. I didn't, I didn't know the, the behind the, the behind the story. Yeah. So how do, how does that work? I mean, you said when the floodgates open, it, 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 there's gotta be potentially, uh, people who want something and and you're like oh, I'm booked up I can't do another song until X date or something like that almost like writers hiring an editor so sorry I can't help you until X or a producer for your album yeah or you know it's the same it's a it's a commissioned piece of art and I, I do I also do commission paintings so it's it's the same I have time slots that get booked and I'm like people sometimes message me and they're like can you write a song for me for next month? And sometimes I can, and sometimes I can, and they have to wait like six months or however right. long. It's, it's, it's yeah, it's, it works as the, exactly the same way. Yeah. So when you're commissioning either um, uh, having uh, art commissioned or music commissioned, are you still meeting with those same two muses or, or have they changed a little? Are they wearing different hats? What's the deal? No, they're the same. They come and go. Uh, and I entertain both of them. Excellent. <laughs> it's really complicated. You know, I feel like I have, in a, in a way, I feel like I have five kids. I've got my two boys. I've got art and music and myself. I also need attention. <laughs> my husband is not one of my kids. I, I don't ever feel like I need to take care of him. We right. have this, we have like such an amazing relationship where we both work hard to take care of our kids and we take care of ourselves. 
and we just really enjoy spending time together. And I mean, we help each other out, obviously, like I take care of him when he needs me to, but for the most part, you know, we, we really kind of just do our own thing together, but art and music, my kids are really demanding and art and music is really demanding as well. They're, they're both demanding. So, yeah. One last question. Uh, when, when you collaborate with Jason, um, how does that collaboration work? Particularly when you're, you know, you've got the different, the shift work, <laughs> you know, for, for, for the art, how does, how does, how do you work on that stuff together? It actually, it works really well. Um, I write the songs and then I pass them on to him and he produces them. Okay, cool. Yeah. And you produce everything in your home, right? You have studio, uh, art studio and music studio? Yeah, so this is, I'm in our music studio right now. Um, you can't see there's a bunch of gear over here and gear over there and there's guitars everywhere. Um, and so this is where he works during the day, making the music. And then um, I have a, a studio space upstairs in our house where I create art and write songs. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. So one la- uh, sort of two last questions. The very, very last question before just the closing is, what would you tell Megan, who was sitting there in the, at the drafting table in the art studio and had this vision of, I'm going to take a leap and I'm going to produce an album. Is there any advice you would go back and, and give young Megan? No advice. I would just tell her that I love her. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> Megan, where can people find out more about you, learn about you, your art, your music, your our story where can they find you online um they can find me a bunch of places i'm on um, facebook and instagram uh and they can also find me i have an art website megansmithart.com and also our song music.com and um i don't know you can put those in the show notes too if you want and definitely will megan thank you so much for taking the time to hang out with me today thank you so much for your wonderful questions it's really great to chat with you